Um, are you on mute? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes. There we go. I don't know what was going on with that. I just unplugged it and plugged it back in. Hey, you know, sometimes it's the the, the simplest answers. Right. Um, <clears throat> so this was a fun one. Oh yeah, no, um, I was kind of peeking the notes on Satan. I'm so sorry. My ADD is really kicking my ass today, but um, I think I have some good points. I think it's gonna stretch out into a whole segment just with what I have up in here. Um, but yeah. you were, you're gonna be, okay, I really need to start recording these on video, but um, look what I drew for the tarot scope this week. First of all, um, Scorpio, okay. Oh, hey girl. Hey girl, um, the devil reversed. You can't, you can't script this. You can't, you literally cannot script this. Uh, but I'm like, I, I wish I had this on video because this was literally like sticking out when I did the shuffle. And I was like, oh, that's the card. Oh, it's the devil. This, I uh, mean, is this is a Satan themed episode? Um, I, uh, the only thing that would have been better is if you had gotten Capricorn. Oh, I know. I know. I almost thought about, <laughs> I almost, I almost thought about doing Capricorn on purpose. Um, I mean, the good news is like, we're sharing the patio ladies portion with Patreon now. So they'll all hear this about how you like wish that you had recorded it because you got the devil on our devil themed episode. Yeah. So, um, so we're, we're in the presence of his greatness. Um, Hail let, Satan. Let me go get a little more soft blanky just really, really quickly. I also need to close my door because um, Bailey is back home. So I'm being kind of rude right now, even. Oh, well, send my apologies to Bailey. Yeah, one moment, one moment. <laughs> well, I mean, while Nick's gone, I can show y'all. I'm wearing my new uh, Haunted Mansion t-shirt that I got because Eric and I went to Disneyland for our seventh anniversary, which was, um, it's really fun, really fun to go to Disneyland as a grown up without children. And the Haunted Mansion is the best ride. So I got my like super cozy giant Haunted Mansion t-shirt that I am now sleeping in and it glows in the dark. I'm like, you can't really tell, but this and then the, the back says like Haunted Mansion, which you can see a little bit there. It glows in the dark very impressively um but yeah this episode was interesting i'm excited for you guys to like hear us get into it because uh satan triggering <laughs> for christian kids everywhere um but also like kind of a hard topic to whittle down like i think that was a big challenge and he's back and he's back that's right okay let me just look, do my little draggy droppy situation here we go we're just gonna go right over here and then i'm gonna put you i'm gonna put baby in the corner nobody Even puts baby I'm... in the corner oh i'm putting baby in the corner i'm so sorry baby um i i um right. i know that we're we're like new to sharing patio ladies but i do have to tell people I cannot overstate the number of times Nick and I have made baby in the corner jokes while we're getting our screen situated. Um, it's true. It's true. I don't even like dirty dancing that much, but it's just like when I'm dragging the little window with Shannon into the corner so I can read my notes because I'm a goddamn professional. Uh, we call that putting baby in the corner. That's just a little fun fact about a little behind the scenes, you know, a little BTS. BTS, baby. All right. Well, let's get into it because I think this will be fun. Um, all right. Hello and welcome to Wands and Fronds, the weekly podcast where we cover magic, herbalism, and more. I'm Shannon. And I'm Nick. And we're your co-hosts. So today I am back 
in my full last set of Invisalign trays for a few more days. So I'm a little lispier again. Hopefully this will be like done soonish. So forgive me. But today I am talking about Solomon seal, which most of you probably are more familiar with it called um, High John the Conqueror. I feel like that's how I had heard of it before. But Solomon seal is also a super like well-known common name. And I'm like, drum roll, please. <laughs> I'm talking about Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan, a.k.a. the devil, Bone Daddy, Beelzebub, Methuselah. You get it. I'm talking about the devil. And that was um, a challenge to figure, because like we could, there could be an entire podcast on depictions of the devil throughout history. But we're going to talk a little bit about it. I, I, I do love this. Uh, I think we really had a run of very spooky themed episodes. And uh, on that note, I'm talking about Satanism. Woo. The, is, the ism of Satan. The ism of Satan. Well, before we head down to Georgia with the devil. Uh, okay, Nick, I do want... I do want to say up top, um, I love that that was the unofficial title of this episode. I would just like to share with the class, if I may, that I was weirdly obsessed with that song as a child. Um, I did no less than three different tap routines to that song in dance. It was a very popular like tap dance song when I was growing up for some reason. Um, I, no, cause my dad had the VHS and it was like, um, I guess it was like an EP, not VHS, cassette. Oh my God. I'm literally like, I can't even remember this ancient technology, but he had, we had the cassette and it was just that, that song on one side. And then <laughs> there was like an extended instrumental on the other, the B side. But we, one of my favorites, we would listen to it almost every day. and. I, I think that informs a lot about who I am as a person. But yeah, when did you feel the magic this week? I mean, I'm going to be cheesy and say it was very corporate magic. But we went to Disneyland for our anniversary. And it was kind of like <laughs> tapping back into that childhood wonder and magic that actually left me feeling like kind of refreshed. And it's like, I get it. Disney's the big bad. but. Disneyland is really fun and it was it was just a great time and I think there's something about getting into like a mindset of play that I think helped kind of unblock some of my magical energy channels because I have been feeling so like just not magical lately and there was just something like so refreshing about getting into like um an a, like a day where I wasn't expected to act like an adult and that was just really nice. That That is very nice. That is very nice. I would say, um, well, gosh, you know, it has been such a, such a long week for me. Um, I did kind of clopin into a double into another clopin recently um, amidst sort of other things that are going on. But what i will say is that i did have a, a a pretty nice walk around sunset the other day um Ooh. i mean gosh i'm like struggling to think of a good answer to this just because i really uh you know i feel like that's a fair thing though because i have been in that way and it's like look we do a podcast on witchcraft, but we're also like people. And sometimes you go through phases where you might not be like feeling your witchy magical self for a little while. And that's normal. And it comes back and it comes in cycles. You know, I would say though, like kind of after the eclipse, I have felt very depleted. Yeah, same. That eclipse took it out of me and I am I'm exhausted. Like I told my boss yesterday, I was like, I think I've hit this point where I'm just going to be tired until January. And I genuinely feel that. So 
we'll see. No. I mean, I'm taking off an extra day next week. So I'm only working one day Thanksgiving week, which will be really nice. And then I am like super privileged and getting two full weeks off for Christmas, which I just want to say that is the longest vacation I will have had in like well over a decade. So yes, I'm getting two weeks off and I am so grateful and I understand how privileged I am. But also that is the longest stretch of time I will have had off since I was like basically in college. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. You know what I will say that I think is a contender though is I did make like a baked mac and cheese this week. Um and because they keep running out of the one I like at HEB. So I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to make it my damn self. And it actually came out really good, but I was just like, or you know what, you know what I will say, you know what I will say, is I did have this moment recently, the night that I made the mac and cheese. It was, you know, kind of a couple nights before my roommate came back home. And I had had a couple glasses of wine and I was actually just like sobbing on my patio uncontrollably as I often do. But in a way it was it, that was just very cathartic because like, it's hard to describe, like I was crying in a, in a good way, but it was like so nice to just have like a comforting meal. Um, it's cathartic. And I don't know, I'm just all over the place this week, you guys, if you couldn't tell. Big Sam, big Sam. So we're going to do our best. But but again, it's like, we're also real people. So if anyone else is feeling that way, let us know. Because I, I think that the consensus among people that I know tends to be that shit's a bit funky right now. Mm -hmm. And it's like cold in Texas, which is weird. But also, you know, the other day I went into work and it was like multiple people had also not been able to sleep the night before. Like there's just something in the air. Everyone's tired, but we're here and it's, we're doing, we're doing a late ones and fronds. It's 9 PM where I'm at, which means my bedtime is a whopping like eight hours away. So we really need to get, we really need to get going. Right. It's 7 p.m. here, which means my bedtime is two hours away. <laughs> I wake up at 5 a.m. So let's go. Okay. Solomon Seal or Polygonatum Multiflorum. It has some really cool common names, though. Of course, we already talked about High John the Conqueror, but Seal Root, Lady Seal, St. Mary Seal, and my personal fave, Sow's Teats. Lo love, love when we get to talk about teats. I mean, look, we're talking about the devil. We got to talk about teats. Am <laughs> I right? Um, so it used to be in the lily family, but now it's in the asparagaceae or the asparagus family, which admittedly kind of feels like a downgrade. Like, I'm no asparagus shame, but to go from lily to asparagus, like... Womp womp. Um, the, I, you know, I mean, it's like if you were choosing teams, if you were choosing team names or, you know, it's like I think a lily, like lily is kind of sounds like a cooler team than the asparagus team. It's like one of them is a beautiful flower and also like super associated with death, which I love. And the other is going to make your pee smell bad. <laughs> like... Anyway, um, it is a plant, though, that it's like there are cultivars around the world, but there is a native U.S. species, which is dope. We don't get to talk about that a lot. A lot of times it's like, and this is from Europe, because Western herbalism focuses a lot on European plants. But you can find it here in the woodlands from Georgia all the way up to Southern Carolina um, and Maine, and even like spanning, you know, out towards the east from there. And then it's also found here on the west coast of the U.S. So most places except for the middle and the deserty places. Like it doesn't love dry, <laughs> deserty, not moist. It, it really enjoys like uh, woodlands. <laughs> so, you know, sorry, uh, Nick, basically. Um, you can probably get some of it, but like, I think the temperature extremes are maybe going to be a bit much for it. So it's a, it's a shaded woodland plant. Um, 
I realize I think I'm a shaded woodland person is really oh gonna... yeah I think I think the Baba Yaga in both That's of us the... can I identify as a shaded woodland person um <laughs> so it can do well in sunnier places but you know shade's the way to go and if you assumed that it loves nutrient-rich soil because it's from the woodlands you're right leaf detritus like it don't play detritus breaks down and becomes like compost and a um, bunch of nutrients for the soil so if something likes woodlands you're gonna need to plant it in nutrient rich soil so solomon seal does tend to grow in patches a la asparagus i don't know if any of y'all have ever seen asparagus growing asparagus grows up out of the ground like that like asparagus it's but actually it really it's actually really funny yeah so uh a la asparagus it grows in patches and the stems of these plants can get up to three feet tall and then the height kind of causes them to droop over basically to about two feet tall and it's like kind of pretty and dramatic and then the leaves have these really beautiful like distinct sort of like parallel monocot veins lining light green leaves that sort of clasp at the base and the way that you can kind of imagine that is if you think about what a peace lily leaf looks like right on like a traditional peace lily um they're pretty similar i mean there's a reason that they used to be grouped with lilies i think when you look at the leaves you can kind of like see that um the flowers they hang under the stems and clusters the clusters can be like two flowers all the way up to seven and they're creamy white so it's like these drooping creamy white flowers <laughs> where we get to sow's teats, which I'm like never going to stop laughing about. Um, and the flowers will produce fruit that has like three or four seeds. And the fruits can get, you know, all the way to like a super blackish blue, even like a reddish purple kind of on that spectrum though, right? It can be like slightly lighter. It can get all the way to where they almost look black. And the root is where the magic is, like both literal and metaphysical. And the roots are really interesting looking they're cream colored but they're they're really structural and almost kind of look like bones so they're white and they get these scars on them they look like stamps where like last year's stems rotted off and they're kind of like knobbly and they can look like spine vertebra or even like gnarled knuckle bones depending on how it's spreading but the scars on the root is actually where the term seal comes from in Solomon's seal. So it's not seal like, like the animal clapping. Uh, it's like the seal that you put on fancy invitations. Um, I want to, I want to get a seal. I'm actually very inspired by sh friend of the pod Shannon's packaging with the wax seal. Oh, her wax seal packaging on her packaging is amazing. Also, the color scheme is like kind of similar to the shirt I'm wearing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, with, well, the, in the one I got too, yeah, where it's like um, teal with like a little swirl of purple in it. Like, yeah, love the, love those colors. But j shout out. We know she's shout listening. Out. So that's a shout out. <laughs> um, the good news about St. John, or not St. John, Hi John the Conqueror, uh, is that the plants self-propagate via rootstock. So it like creeps below the soil. And there are a few cultivars that are used primarily in landscaping. So like if you're planting some, just make sure you're getting like a good medicinal cultivar. But at the end of the day, you're really not gonna find Solomon's seal often in the wild. You'll find Solomon's plume, which has slightly different flowers, but Solomon's plume is not like the same as Solomon seal. You can't exchange them. So like, I really wouldn't suggest trying to wild harvest this unless you're like absolutely pro but the other problem is it's like super slow to reproduce. So you probably aren't gonna find a large enough like stand, like a large enough like patch of it to be able to like ethically harvest. Because remember they say you should never take more than a third of what you're harvesting in the wild. Solomon seal doesn't tend to like naturally thrive in like these huge patches. So you're not really easily able to find enough to ethically forage it anyway. So just like grow it yourself. Again, shady, moist, well-draining soil. You want something that's not going to be super crowded with a lot of other low growth. But then throughout the years, you can actually divide the roots to kind of help the plant spread. You can like divide things to like give it a hand since it spreads really slowly. 
Um, and that's like the way you're going to have to do this is as the aerial parts die back, basically you're going to like work your fingers into the soil and then you're going to get into the root stock and kind of give it a little shimmy, like a little shimmy shake and like slowly work it out. And then you're going to use a broad knife to pry the root upward and sever it below the apical portion at the base of the root stock. Apical is just a fancy word for like the apex of the root. And so that's that's how you're going to do that. And then you can replant the bulbs. That way it'll grow more and more year after year. But you can actually really only harvest the plants every third or fourth year. So this is a slow grower, but it's pretty badass. Like it's a mild starchy root. It was used as a food like source during famine and lean times around the world, especially in Europe. But if you're growing it at home, since the roots are so slow and you can't really get a full harvest all the time, you can actually use the spring shoots to eat for kind of like a bit of an asparagus vibe. Like that's pretty common in like Turkish cuisine to use uh, High John the Conqueror shoots in food, which I think is super cute. I, I also, I love a bamboo shoot moment. Oh my God, bamboo shoots are one of my favorite things. The crunch. It's, it's, the, crunch. The, it's, the, it's the crunch for me, honey. <laughs> so let's get into the medicinal uses. Um, Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. I'm not a doctor. Nick's not a doctor. This podcast nope. is not intended to treat or diagnose anything. Please don't use a podcast to diagnose yourself. Always talk to your doctor before you start an herbal regimen. Okay. So I'm going to be talking a lot about Matthew Wood today. Um, he is a Western herbalist whose work I really love. I have a couple of his books. He also stands Solomon's Seal, which I like. And his stance is basically that the indigenous people of North America have it down when it comes to the best ways to like use Solomon's Seal to maximize its, uh, its efficacy. So Matthew Wood is a big advocate of the doctrine of signatures. So remember the doctrine of signatures is that like the way a plant looks can help you understand what body systems the plant works well with. So again, remember, I talked about how the rhizome can look kind of like knobby vertebra on a spine or like gnarled joints. Well, when you cut the root crosswise, it also looks like periosteum. And the periosteum, it's the membrane of like blood vessels and connective tissue that envelops your bones. So, uh, hi, it's good for your musculoskeletal system. And this is one that was like a really big deal with like both black and white folk herbalists in the American South for musculoskeletal issues and to like soothe mucous membranes because like that periosteum vibe, you know, that's like a membrane of connective moist tissues. You're kind of getting the mucous membrane stuff there. But again, in like modern times, Wood has lobbied hard to get herbalists to include High John the Conqueror in contemporary Materia Medica. And I think that it's like, it's very valid. It's got a great affinity for your musculoskeletal system and connective tissues, which we know, especially with like modern work habits are something that a lot of people need extra support for. And he also does a lot of work to like help categorize plants like based on body systems. And also Matthew Wood does some talk about, um, medical astrology and i'll i'll mention this later but saturn is the ruler of your skeletal system so it's also a saturnian plant which thinking boundaries things that create structure your musculoskeletal system like it's all kind of of the same theme right so i think that if you're looking for things to help with uh you know uh dryness or laxity in your system, this is gonna be a good one. So if you broke a bone and you're trying to heal it up, you know, you've got that like laxity there between it because it's not firm and connected the way bones are supposed to be. It can help sort of like build that up. If you're someone who struggles with things like osteoarthritis, have you have like achy joints, High John the Conqueror can actually help like strengthen and even like it can like strengthen and tighten or help like stretch out to give you better range of motion in your musculoskeletal system, like specifically in your joints without causing a lot of damage and scarring. So it can help build up bone, 
but it can also help um, build up like connective tissues. So if you've had like surgery or even if you're just like super athletic and active, um, you know, I know for me, one of the reasons I drink metal so religiously is because I'm a runner and running is uh, notoriously bad for your hips and your knees. I have so much less like joint pain using nettles, but I'm definitely going to try out some High John the Conqueror. Um, they also suggest adding it to like a combination of something with like bone set if you're healing from like a broken bone or some sort of like surgery on your bones. Like those are always very invasive and take a long time to recover from. You can also add it to, uh, you know, a tea with something like horsetail or comfrey. I think it's like a really good like one-two punch combo herb. And it's used to help, again, though, with mucous membranes. Like it's soothing, demulcent, it's anti-inflammatory, it's cooling. So all kind of things that you also want a lot of times for your joints. But of course, that's also good for your like mucous membranes, like things like ovo-uterine issues, gastrointestinal problems, respiratory concerns. So it's one that you can make into a decoction. I know I said tea or the earlier, but really it's better in a decoction. Remember, the only difference is in a decoction, you're boiling the herbs, like with the herbs in there, you're boiling it down as opposed to like just doing a steep of boiling water over the herb. Um, tinctures straightforward. So let's get into the magic, right? I think this is a good one. It's good for your bones. Good for your bones. Good for your joints. Looks like a spine. Give us, so, give us your bones, not squirrel bones. Show your bones, if you will. So, let's talk about magic again. It's Saturnian, and Saturn does rule the skeletal system, so that's fun. But we also know, like, this is the name. It comes from like Solomon, King Solomon, right? Solomon Seal. What's one of the facts that's most iconic about King Solomon? Uh, well, I, I know it's coming up, but I'll just go ahead and say it. It's actually that he worked with demons and exorcisms a lot. Yeah, he loved him and exorcism. So he like bound and exorcised a bunch of demons so he could construct the uh, sacred temple of Solomon, which is like kind of his thing. So, you know, exorcism, big deal for King of Solomon. Uh, also, big thing for Solomon's seal. So it's great for things like banishing and protection. I mean, I guess, or exorcism if you're a Catholic priest listening to this, which, um, <laughs> hey, Hi. Uh, boy, don't do we have any some, children, please. Boy, do we have some questions for you, Catholic priest <laughs> listening to this podcast. Right. Um, so I love the suggestion I read in a book, though, to place parts of the root in like four corners of your home to act as like a ward. Because really, it's like, if you think about Saturn, it provides structure, it provides boundaries, you know, which is why it rules the skeletal system. Again, structure, boundaries, keeping things in order. You can use like the root to serve as sort of like a magical structure, right? So I love the idea of doing like a thorough house cleansing and then calling in good energies. And once that's done, setting the Solomon seal. because that boundary goes both ways, right? Like it keeps the good energies in while also keeping the negative energies out. That's like what boundaries do. Um, it's, it's again, a seal, S-E-A-L. It will seal things. So it's, it's Saturnian though. So again, it's like clutched with boundaries. And I love the idea of using like Solomon seal tea. If you're doing like rituals around building better boundaries and, um, wow. Aren't the holidays a great time for that kind of work? Oh yes, absolutely. No, I, I'm literally just like, I hate to say it, but I'm so glad I'm just one of those people that has really kind of veered towards doing more friend based holiday gatherings where it's like, that's my, that's my chosen family. And you know, it's just like, you really have to be so on guard to not let all of that toxic energy into yourself, like over the holidays, because it's just, you get so tired of just sitting there while you're like Trump or uncle 
says a bunch of racist and homophobic and God knows what else stuff. Like, yep. Oh my God. But I, I heard my new favorite boundary phrase. There's this woman on TikTok who's like a boundary coach and she collects boundary phrases and I cannot wait to whip this one out. It's what an odd thing to say out loud. <laughs> I can't oh. wait to say that to Mama. Anyway, so um, you could also, though, if you are working on magical contracts, you could use Solomon Seal to like bind that. So, you know, if you're trying to like get into a deal with a deity or a spirit, you know, you could incorporate St. John's, uh, not St. John's. Why do I keep wanting to say St. John's work? Solomon Seal. Um, again, just be careful. Like, don't go into these things lightly. Um, I do also have to say, like, with the boundaries, I forgot to add, crush it, put it under your doormat, take a drink. Um, <laughs> finally, the Pisces in me was very interested in the use of binding your spirit to this plane using Solomon's seal. So I, I think this is a great choice, too, for people who maybe do, like, a lot of psychic work or astral projecting. I think that St. Uh, Solomon Oh my God, Seal, it's not St. John's Wort, Shannon. I don't know why it's like in my brain. Um, Solomon Seal, I think is like a great choice for sort of your spiritual aftercare, like to help keep you situated in your body once you're finished with that type of spiritual work. I think that's like a really great use for it. So that's all I have for today on uh, Solomon Seal, which is not St. John's Ward. I don't know what the fuck is wrong with my brain. Anyway, my sources, The Herbarium, The Poison Path Herbal, and Matthew Woods, The Practice of Traditional Western Herbalism. Snaps for Matthew Wood. Oh, Matthew. Okay, so you guys, this week in... <laughs> how do we get ourselves into these situations where it's like we're gonna cover something so broad so broad uh satanism well it's actually not that broad actually you know the big surprise here was that satanism is actually very boring <laughs> which i love i love that perspective um i feel like i've i've gone into segments thinking that it was going to be boring and then it turned out to be fucking weird and exciting but in this one, I thought it was going to be weird and exciting. And it actually just ended up being very boring. Um, but I do want to give a shout out kind of right at the top of that sound on TikTok that's like, barely off, Beelzebub, Beelzebub, uh, Asmodeus, it's a Satanus, jam. Lucifer. Um, especially I mean, on, on like a video iconic. of cats. Um, but really, like, modern Satanism isn't exactly what you would expect it to be, especially if you come from, like, a Judeo-Christian background. Um, it's widely regarded as an atheistic organization with Satan as a symbolic object of wor worship, uh, mainly because it's like they are just largely at odds with mainstream Christianity, especially here in this country, having these benefits, um, having this monopoly of Christian churches kind of cashing in on these benefits while still having political sway under our very flimsy system of separation in church and state that we're supposed to have in our constitution, but in in practice seems to be very much uh, not the case. Yeah. Again, um, if you're in a church and you hear them start talking politics, report them to the IRS. You yeah, can do that. You can do that. Um, and, you know, I would say well done Satanists for fighting that power. And I would say that the two best sort of satanic PR stunts in recent memory are they did have this huge celebration when Florida changed their laws to allow prayer in schools. Um, basic, basically being like, oh, finally satanic children can praise him at school hail and that's, satan in hail, public hail satan in public and that's what the christians really wanted to hear but they really had no rebuttal to that because within the confines of the law that should be perfectly fine um 
And then they do have this ongoing lawsuit with Texas that I think is very interesting about their fetal remains burial law. So in Texas, we do have this law where if you get an abortion or have a miscarriage, you have to pay for the fetal remains to be buried in a graveyard. Like, uh, and uh, Can I just say, thank God that's new because I had an abortion in the year of our Lord, 2015. Thank God I didn't have to fucking bury that cluster of cells after I already spent hundreds of dollars and had to go multiple times because the state of Texas was already pulling some fuckery. Didn't they, did, did, didn't they make you, I mean, that was after the ultrasound law, right? Didn't they make yeah. you like, they made you like look at the ultrasound. And they made me quote unquote, listen to the heartbeat, which like is a, it doesn't sound like anything because it's not a heartbeat. That's yeah. Cause there's not a heart there. No. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, the doctor who did my abortion was great. He was like, I'm going to read all this stuff to you because I'm legally required. And he was like, I have to list out all of the different complications that can happen with abortion. He's like, but it's not nearly as long of a list as it is with pregnancy. Um, thank God for abortion care providers. Um, and so I do think that this activist aspect of the modern Church of Satan is very cool and very good. And they do publicly support women's rights and queer rights, and that's all very cool and very good. Um, I would also say, just sort of here up top, that the modern Church of Satan, which we, we are referring to Levian Satanism, as it's now known, um, as opposed to the Satanic Temple or Thelema, which was Aleister yeah. Crowley's thing. God. No one loved come like Aleister Crowley. Um, and, you know, they have this main tenant of not harming others, which does seem like sound moral standing and pretty much in line with the Wiccan read. So, again, no problems there, right? And Satanism isn't so bad. I think most Satanists are just very, very vocal and politically active atheists. Um, yeah. For the most part, that seems to be the consensus. They're spicy atheists. They're spicy atheists. And, you know, in practice, there's nothing especially offensive about Satanism either. There's no actual human sacrifices or baby eating or whatever else was bandied about during the Satanic panic in the 80s and 90s. Which yeah, I when... It they were like listening to metal music will turn you into a baby munching orgy loving satanist right and i do remember at least a little bit of that um you know i do remember like very sensationalist pieces especially around halloween that was always a thing oh, God. in texas yeah. um but in local news but also on like unsolved mysteries and actually one of my favorite things on unsolved mysteries though because they did you know, it's not good investigative journalism by any any means, but they did talk about how a lot of the satanic panic was sort of falsely implanted memories. Like there was a couple of therapists oh, yeah. that were involved in this where people would come and they would have these sort of false memories implanted about their parents initiating them in these satanic rituals with like blood drinking yeah. and abuse and, you know, trigger warning, but like, very sexual things with children, with none of yeah. which actually happened and like verifiably no. didn't happen. And it really did come down to just some like bad faith actors, these therapists sort of perpetuating the satanic panic by creating these false memories. And like hypnotism is still very poorly understood as something that does seem to work on some people who were suggestible. Well, and there's this whole study. So in one of my, I took a class on biopsychology in college and we like got into this research where it's like, it sounds so hokey that you're like, oh, well, how could someone like make you remember something? But essentially like, and in, in like the dumbest downed way I can talk about it because I am not a biopsychologist. Essentially, like your memories are stored in long term memory. And so when you're pulling them out to think about them, you're bringing them into your short term memory. While they're in your short term memory, they're very susceptible to getting altered before they get tucked back into that file. So they did this big study where they actually interviewed a bunch of people 
kind of like what happened here with the satanic panic. And they would ask them very suggestive questions about whether or not they got lost in a mall as a child. And by the end of like this sort of back and forth, all of the people in the study had a very distinct memory of getting lost in the mall and like riding up and down an escalator and like looking for their mom. Plot twist, none of them had that happen. Right, but it's like right, right. That transition between long-term and short-term memory, it, you're very it's very easy to like corrupt that data file when it's moving back and forth. And it's not about like well, the people yeah. having bad intentions there. It's like it's kind of a short it's kind of a, a shortcoming in the human memory. Yes. Well, and what I would say is that it's almost kind of like dreaming too, where it's like yeah. Uh, you know, it's like the mall that is a real mall that you've been to, theoretically. I mean, you know, yeah. it's like you, you probably get asked that question. And so if someone asked me that question, for some reason, I'm imagining Ridgemar Mall. Oh, see, know. I went to Hewlin. Hewlin Mall is where my brain went. But but either way, we're thinking of the great malls of North Texas. Um, you know, history will remember them fondly. Actually, I, I do just want to side note here. I did see this incredible page that's like all of these 80s and 90s like indoor outdoor liminal spaces where you know like the trees and the fountains at the mall oh my god can we just talk about the liminal space that is the rainforest cafe oh my god uh the rainforest cafe is cursed the the animatro the animatronics the fake thunderstorm the giant saltwater fish tank I mean, uh, you want to talk about Satanism alive and well. Satan, uh, <laughs> the, the, the devil is alive and well in America. Uh, and it's called the Rainforest Cafe. And um, you're not going to convince me otherwise. But no, I do remember the Satanic Panic. I remember when it would be on the local news around Halloween time, you know. And there is also always this thing where it's like they don't adopt out black cats around Halloween because they think they're going to be sacrificed to the devil. And I, I, as far as we know, that doesn't actually happen. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really like, a, it's interesting how much history does have a cyclical nature because I'm going to talk about like, you've mentioned it here a little bit, but I'll talk about it a little bit more in the section about Satan to like the early witch trials in satanic panic that was happening in like the 1400s. It looks a lot like what was happening in the eighties and the nineties. Exactly. I mean, and yeah, this is a good place to dive in a little bit historically because even though it was a huge part of the witch hunts in the 16th and 17th centuries, and even the Spanish inquisition, there's actually not evidence that people were ever worshiping Satan. In no, that way. no, and they weren't. That, if it was actually happening, there would be something. Yeah, and I've got in my segment at the end, I'm going to talk about this potentially nefarious group of people who got together and started writing some bullshit about what was allegedly going down in the Western Alps. <laughs> well, and I mean, you know, they accused the Knights Templar of being oh satanic. God, yeah. They accused the Freemasons of being satanic. Like pretty much any organization that has had some kind of political power. I mean, the Knights Templar were really, I mean, they got so much during the Crusades and they became this yeah. powerful order. And like really that power attracts scrutiny. And that's really the thing with a lot of this is that Again, it's like these bad, there's very much bad faith actors who are trying to get that power for someone else, usually at the end of the day, on these like organizational accusations, like against the Knights yeah. Templar. Um, and that's really, you know, uh, it, seemingly like a very good strategy, you know, because then it's like, Oh, they're sa they're sa Satanist, you know, like they lose power, and then the power has to go somewhere else. So, um, but so really, we don't have evidence of anyone actually worshiping Satan until you get to Aleister Crowley, who. Here's the thing, Aleister Crowley, founded the Thelemites. 
right? They call themselves Thelemites. The religion is called Thelema. Um, and that is a very, very popular like branch of esoteric ceremonial magic. It's actually mostly based on ancient Egyptian, but there is elements of like Indian, Near Eastern, even some like alt North African, like non-Egyptian stuff. Like it's very all over the place. But yeah, one it's of the very like a it's like a hodgepodge mixed salad of like iconography and belief systems. It's a bit of a hodgepodge. Well, it is very much a bit of a hodgepodge, but Alistair Crowley did lean into the image a oh, little yeah. bit. And here's and here's what I will say. Um Alistair Crowley was a member of the Order of the Golden Dawn around the turn of the century. And they actually didn't care for him. Because not a lot of people did. Not a lot of people did. Because here's the thing. I mean, he was an openly bisexual man. Nothing wrong with that. And we're not gonna say there's something wrong with that because there's nothing wrong with that. But the Order of the Golden Dawn was not here for basing their ceremonial magic solely around sex magic. And Aleister Crowley really wanted to lead into that. As, Aleister Crowley loved semen. <laughs> and there was so much in the thing where it's about semen. Here's the thing. And here, here's where I'm, here's where you kind of lose me on Satanism. I mean, not that Thelema is Satanism, but it uses a lot of the same imagery and aesthetics as Satanism and for shock value, because Aleister Crowley was yeah. all about shock value. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about Aleister Crowley's life if I may, because I do think it's very interesting and I do think it does give some clues as to kind of the, what makes the modern satanic movement unsavory to me. Yeah. Um, so first things first, Aleister Crowley was a very, very, very privileged white man in an era in a country when that, could get you so far in life. I mean, we are literally talking about early 1900s Britain, the height of the British Empire. Yeah, that takes you all the way to the top at that time. That's the top. Being a rich white guy in England in You're the, the year, king of the in, world. In like 1911, that's, that's as high up as you can go. It's the reason why cis, like cis white, like straight men are so angry. That's where they were. And now they don't get to be anymore. And now they don't get to be anymore. But yeah. here's the but here's where you kind of like lose me on the whole Aleister Crowley thing, because he was the most privileged of a person that you could be. He was openly bisexual and still didn't go to jail, a la Oscar Wilde. Um, there was kind of like a big backlash to the basically ex I mean, the exile of Oscar Wilde, and then he died in prison. Um because it I mean, it's they're a pretty grim way to go just for fucking a dude. But it's like you are already the most privileged person in the world, and you're like, and you're like reacting to the Christian Church in this way, and you're you're kind of kicked out of like the esoteric sphere because you just want to come on everything. Yep. And so, you, you know, it's like, what I will say is kind of like a turn off to me is because it's like, he already lived this life of luxury and extravagance and it was never enough. And then he made a whole like spiritual movement around having orgies and set himself up as the prophet of it all and just kind of went around the world like doing quote unquote sex magic and... You know, it's, I mean, I love the idea of like centering your spirituality around your own free will and doing what you want. Like, I actually think that's not morally offensive. But when you get into, I think, I think where, where I kind of am like, you know, 
it's like if the tur if like these like satanic orders were like by women or by queers. Yeah, that's I can get behind that. But the but kind of the big through line that I noticed with Aleister Crowley, with Anton LaVey, I mean, even with the guy that's like the Temple of Satan. Um Yeah, the Temple of Satan's a shit show. Oh my god, Greaves, whatever, whatever that guy, Greaves. Rob is it Robert Greaves? Oh no, it's something. Um, hold on, I'm looking it up now. Because they all ha they all do this really thing, this really like kind of cringy thing where they all have um these like gr dumb fake names. Oh, it's Lucian Graves. Lucian Graves, yeah. And it's like his real name is like Steve or something. Um oh no, his real name is Douglas Mesner Mesner. Right, right, right. So it's like, okay, yeah, it's like, I, I mean, here's the thing. Alistair Crowley was not Alistair Crowley's real name. His real name was like Alfred. And he was like, Alistair is the Irish version of Alfred or whatever his reasoning was that that worked for him. Um, and they all picked these ridiculous names. Um, even Anton Cezandor LaVey, like, that's not his real fucking... He's from Chicago. That's not his real fucking name. No. And so here's where I here's where I don't like it. Where it's like, it's all these privileged white men who just want to party, who just want to have orgies, who just want to do drugs, and then say that spirituality, it does make the rest of us look like fucking weirdos. And when most of us are just like actual regular people. Yeah. Um, in like the witchy community, which, you know, the big schism with... Alistair Crowley was like with what later became like Wicca and like that branch of things where it's like this sort of Ayn Randian kind of super selfish ideology yeah. where it's like, you're only looking out for number one, like your pleasure, your will, what you want is the most important thing. Getting what you want is the most important thing. If someone tries to stop you from getting what you want, that is... They're a, the problem. They are the problem, not you, which seems very toxic. And the reason I did want to talk about Aleister Crowley and like that sort of ideology is that's very much what was adopted by Anton LaVey in the founding of the first actual Church of Satan. Um, but before I move on to that, I, the reason that Aleister Crowley was accused of being a Satanist was because he believed in what Madame Blavatsky, who we should do, we should absolutely do a segment on Madame Blavatsky. Um, we're basically Madame Blav Blavatsky. Well, plot twist, Madame Blavatsky is a bad person. <laughs> oh yeah, Madame Blavatsky is a bad person. And... Basically, but what she said, though, was that Satan is sort of a neutral deity who does give wisdom to humans. And, you know, I, I don't not take that. I don't I don't not agree with that. Like, you know, I think. I just don't have the proof to say otherwise, but. You know, I don't believe in Christian God, so I don't really believe in Christian Satan either. So you know, maybe something, maybe some other entity going by that name or like using that as an aesthetic. Sure. But you know, whatever. But that's why he was called a Satanist was because he was like, you know, he had this like very, very multi-layered kind of theogony in Thelema that did include a lot of Satanist imagery um, without ever actually coming out and being Satanist, which Anton LaVey really did expound upon with the whole like Ayn Rand, like super selfish, only look out for number one, being kind of like a central tenant. And that kind of rubs me the wrong way. Like I'm, I think, you know, it's like, it should be about community. Like communities do need boundaries and bylaws and things to keep the marginalized members safe and secure. Um, which does kind of bring me to like a modern schism in Satanism because you have 
the Church of the Nine Angles, which was founded in England in the 70s, which was which brought in not only like weird UFO conspiracies, but also anti-Semitism. So it became like Satanism for white power bros, which incredibly problematic, incredibly problematic. Uh, and then we do have to talk about the, the recent scandal with the Temple of Satan, which is an offshoot of Levian Satanism, because here's the thing, and here's where they got in hot water too. Because first of all, the Lucian Greaves guy came out and basically was like, oh, Milo Yiannopoulos should be allowed to speak at USC. If you're actually protesting against him, you can't claim to be doing it on behalf of the Temple of Satan. Like that is not a Satanist viewpoint. We believe in all forms of free speech. And it's like, okay, but. What a weird way to like, you know, kind of pick a pick a side. There's so many other opportunities where you could have actually done some good with your platform, but you're like defending Milo Yiannopoulos, another very, very privileged white man. Um, who, I mean, birds of a feather. Who has no problems finding outlets for his quote unquote free speech elsewhere and it's definitely the right of the students i think to um protest if they don't want their school paying someone to speak there yeah i mean not that your tuition money is going directly to that but i mean at some point he's getting his speaking fee that's coming from somewhere Anyway, but so there was that. And then in a separate scandal with the Temple of Satan, they hired Alex Jones's lawyer to defend them. And it's like, you know, there's just there's just so much to that where it's like the other Satanists, Temple of Satan people, really felt like, you know this very privileged white man who is almost lending a platform to these people at this point um is really like not doing things in the best interest of the marginalized groups that he so ardently claims to support um, yeah and you can't you can't be like oh we're pro women we're pro queer we're pro people of color and then you just keep empowering other privileged white men and i just i have yet to come across in my research any satanic movements that were not figureheaded by some privileged hard partying white guy whose main philosophy on life was that he should be able to have orgies and do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. That's, and that's not a cool spirituality to me. And I'm sorry. Like, I think they do good things politically. Like, yeah, fuck up the ev evangelicals here in America. But I also do think there is like an element of cringe too, just to kind of shift gears here a little bit. Because it's like, if you make your whole ethos, like railing against the predominantly Christian theocracy that we we have are you really doing that for you and that's kind of my thing i'm like i do i do witchcraft stuff for me because i like to do it and it you know it's not about converting people it's not about publicity it's not about any of that it's like because i fucking like doing it i'm not trying to like spread any kind of gospel and it's also, I would also say it's it's kind of cringe because it's like the ACLU does that and they like put on their suits and they go meet these people in court. Um, and, you know, it's like they, they do a perfectly fine job of looking out for people's civil rights and civil rights abuses in general without having to dress like a Catholic priest and have an orgy about it. Like, so... I love that. 
I think you just want to dress up like a Catholic priest and have an orgy, and that's fine, but that's hardly the political statement you think it is, and it's not really that cool, and it's like, grow, just grow the fuck up. Well. Um, and um, I, will, I will say, you know, I, 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 really, I really tried. I really tried to stretch this one out. Because, I mean, there's actually, so, there's a lot of cool information about Aleister Crowley, but we're not talking about Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley didn't identify as a Satanist. If we're looking at the actual, like, worship of Satan or, like, Satanism in general, it's boring. It's boring. They don't do any of the stuff that they are accused of doing. And then, I mean, they themselves are, are, are just a little bit cringy. And then if you look at modern Satanism, like, I'm not even going to say her name, but if you're listening to this podcast, you know who I'm talking about. Like the sexy baby Satanism girl who's on Instagram and TikTok. Yeah. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. I think we all, I think we all know who I'm talking about. Um, that's cringe because it's like, oh, you get mad because people don't take you seriously, but you play up the sexy baby aspect of it. Why? Because of men's egos. The whole history of Satanism kind of boils down to already privileged white men want to inflate their egos even further and add in a dash of savior complex. Add in a dash of savior complex and oh, make it political. And oh my God, here's my thing like militant atheists, I'm sorry. Oh my god! Are, I don't want to talk to you ever at a cocktail party. I don't give literally. A shit. Literally, I will leave. I will leave. And we used to live with two, maybe three, very outspoken militant atheists, and they're like worse than vegans or CrossFitters. They militant are. atheists are so in your face, and it's just like we get it. It's like You're... I'm not trying to fight you, man. Like. You believe once you believe. That's fine. It's like, I'm a queer non-theist. Like, can't Back I be on up. your side? Can't I be on your side without making it my whole personality? They would say no. I would they say would... yes. And that's why we have a podcast together. <laughs> and that is why we have a podcast together. But I'm so excited to hear all about the morning star himself hell yeah so this was kind of a tough topic to get into because um again there could be literally an entire podcast about depictions of satan the development of the character of lucifer but again lucifer morning star lucifer the name they think comes from like the latin morning star which also is what venus is referred to as again venus a planet heavily associated with uh pleasures also lucifer is like the light bringer you know there's a lot of um different angles we could get into but first let's talk about just like the lucifer that most of us are probably most familiar with and that's the lucifer of christianity and abrahamic religions um that's probably where most of our listeners really first started learning about the dude the devil so essentially satan's the bad guy in the bible right? Like he seduces people um, by tempting them with like sins of the body, trying to get them to like give in to carnal desires. Um, in Christianity, he's typically depicted as like a fallen angel who tried to usurp God. And in Islam, he's a jinn. And in Judaism, he's seen as like a character that's more subservient to God, like a metaphor for the Yetzir Hara or like the quote-unquote evil inclination that exists in humanity there is some debate a debate around like early jewish leaders and rabbis and the evolution of a satan type character that looks like what we think about in christianity but in general in judaism satan is not operating of his own free will he's kind of like an aspect of god's will so in the Hebrew Bible, though, we meet Ha Satan, who persecutes the nation of Judea and tests the loyalty of Yahweh's followers. But then we start seeing like a bit of an evolution as we go through the Bible, where he becomes more and more of like a malevolent entity that's the dualistic opposition to God. So there's the book of Jubilees, which is an apocryphal book. So it's not in the canon of either which, like 
It's so dumb to me that, like, literally such a small group of guys in, like, the second century got to decide what was and was not biblically canonical. Oh, I mean, and look, let's talk about the fact that, like, Maccabees is in the, like, Catholic Bible, but not in the evangelical Bible. So it's, like, even within Christian sects in the existing Bibles there are different books because a lot of people in like the Protestant, uh, more evangelical side of Christianity, they thought that Maccabees muddied the waters a bit because there's a character that could have been perceived as a Jesus character that dies and isn't the king's son or whatever, also God and his son at the same time. Anyway, so we're, we're talking about the book of Jubilees though. And in this book, and, and the reason this one's important is because the story here you'll will sound pretty familiar, I think, right? Yahweh gives Satan authority over basically a cabal of angels and their offspring. And all of those folks, the angels and their offspring and Satan are having their like party and trying to get humans to sin so they can punish them. Sounds familiar, right? Mm. I also like have to say, Satan does not technically appear in Genesis. Shannon, you might be thinking, we all know that the serpent is Satan. Well, do we? <laughs> because they, but, they don't, but they don't say that. They don't, they say, don't that. say that. And most Jewish traditions don't believe in a Satan character in the way that Christians do. So it's like, sure. Also, here's what we kind of, we retconned it. We retconned it. Why would an omnipotent God build an impenetrable garden? And have no idea that the serpent was there. Yeah, I mean, that's, and I think that's where Judaism kind of gets at it, is like this idea that Satan is kind of like this, like, inclination towards bad behavior that exists in humanity, as opposed to being like a sentient character. Um, but then, you know, we get into the synoptic gospels, there's Jesus getting tempted by Satan in the desert, which is also like more of the shit where I'm just like, look, if Jesus was a real dude who's supposed to be the son of God, why the fuck is your dad leaving you hanging in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and then not letting you turn rocks into bread to feed yourself? Because like we know you can turn water to wine. So you can turn water to wine as a party trick, but you can't make food out of rocks when you've been starving for 40 days and 40 nights yeah i don't know i just think here's the thing like bible god torah god whatever loves to test people yeah and look how well that worked out for Job. right oh my god no having played Okay, I will say, just as a side note, one time I did get to play Satan on the stage uh, in an adaptation of the play uh, JB by Archibald MacLeish, which is sort of like an updated telling of the story of Job. Um, and I played, I played the devil, and I actually won an award for that um, at the one-act play competition in school because um, my Satan character... <laughs> now, keeping in mind, I was like a little baby witch at the time and was like very much railing against Christianity and very, very much like leaning into my departure from Christianity. Um, but they said my Satan character was very sympathetic and believable, um, as opposed to the God character who was very, played it very cold and imperious. So we have a Paradise Lost situation, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, I do also, I have to plug Satan's coolest role in the Bible. Uh, in Revelations, he is the great red dragon that fights the archangel Michael. I mean, he loses, but he gets to play a fucking great red dragon. Pretty dope. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's some, I mean, if he's, even if it's just LARPing, like, that's, that pretty, sounds pretty cool to Sounds pretty cool to me. Pretty cool. We all love to cosplay. So I, I just think it's important to keep in mind, like when we're talking about the evolution of like Satan as an entity, as a character, 
he was a very, very, very small bit role player in early Christian theology. And in the Middle Ages, he was literally like comic relief in plays. And you get into the Age of Enlightenment and there's people like Voltaire that are like talking about how fucking dumb you have to be to believe in Satan. Like it was not like a big deal historically for a long time. But then here we are in America and we have this evangelical movement. And you're like, what the fuck? What? We'll get into it a little bit. But the depiction of the devil that we're all familiar with, if you're looking historically, really it's starts because popping. It's because the Europeans got so tired of the Puritans, they sent them all here. Right. So you think about the picture of the devil you're familiar with, right? The little horns, his hooves, he's red. He's maybe got like, a, it, it's like a triton. It's a pitchfork, but it's a triton. In a most... trident. A trident. <laughs> trident thank you it's a trident in most things which is again this is important because he's a mashup of pan and poseidon with his trident and bess so before we like get into like the way that europeans got really into the satanic panic and it just like spread here um i think it's fun to talk about representation of the devil in like major artworks so dante's inferno the divine comedy. Uh, I love the like the depiction of the devil here because it is like he is a fallen angel de devil in Dante's Inferno. Um, you know, he dared to rise up against God and then was cast out, but like still got to rule hell, which is like kind of a fun follow up gift, I guess. It's it's it's, it's, a it's cool almost like it's almost like um okay. If you were the devil, would you rather? And this actually is something I do want to discuss because I always hated when you would go to church. And I grew up going to church. I was actually a very good church boy until like I was 12 and I realized I liked uh, dicks. Um, but going to heaven and spending eternity worshiping God and serving him. Not fun. That doesn't sound cool or fun or good at all. No, like it's like I love. I would rather just die than like what I, go be yeah. go be a, a a servant. I love all the jokes and good omens about how boring the music gets after a while in heaven. <laughs> um, but again, so like we're talking about Dante's Inferno and Satan in this one, and Inferno is great. Like the Divine Comedy is one of my favorite trilogies, but I do have to say that um, Inferno, I think, gets all of the uh, it gets all the press. But Purgatorio, the book about Purgatory, is actually much more brutal than the book about Hell. But the devil here, he has big old giant like bat wings that come right out from under his chin, and he has three faces, and they're chewing on Judas Iscariot. Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus. Uh, so Brutus and Cassius. So he's got like a taste for Romans. And you get Judas Iscariot, yeah, yeah, whatever. But two thirds of it is just fucking like Romans, which I'm like, okay. Well, well all right. I, you know, they talk about too, when I was looking into the whole like history of Satanism how in the book of revelations they call it babylon but then they talk about the seven hills and of course rome was famously founded on a region that has seven hills um yeah there was a lot of anger against uh rome at the time of the writing of the bible yeah yeah the thing is um the bible was written for the people who were getting crushed under the roman empire and the problem, and like modern theology aside, one of the things I do really like that Rob Bell, a modern theologian, who I don't like necessarily agree with, but he makes a very good point that it's kind of hard for Americans to understand the Bible because the Bible is written by people being per written for people being persecuted by Rome, and Americans are Rome. So it's like you're trying to build a religion based around something that was built for the people that you're oppressing but you're making yourself the oppressed. <laughs> so it's, um, there's, a it's, it's really, it's really kind of like in parallel to like how 
white women have co-opted most like social justice movements and made them all about themselves, which I mean, I saw this comedian do a really great bit about it on Instagram and whatever. I can't remember who it is, but I just, I do remember the message being very much like, yeah, something that was supposed to be about like people of color and queers, somehow straight white women made it all about them. Yeah. Basically. And it's like, and it's like okay, Joanne, you're not a victim. You're rich. And like, you're fine. You're actually probably one of the few people that could convince your husband to be less of a patriarchal piece of shit. You choose not to because you enjoy the privilege. You enjoy the privilege. But so Satan in Dante's Inferno, um, he's got three faces thinking about triplicity, things associated with witches. But he also, I like that he flaps his big old bat wings to freeze the ice over that encompasses like him and all the other sinners in the ninth circle. Um, so, of course, we got to talk about Faust, uh, the really iconic story of a character who's super successful but still so empty inside. And so he goes to the crossroads and makes a deal with the devil to exchange his soul for unlimited knowledge. Never works out well, but, you know, the oh, devil I, went I down love, to Georgia. I, 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 I love the story of Faust. The story of Faust is great. And then we also have to talk about Paradise Lost. I feel like that's another huge one. So like in Milton's work, we watch Satan, who is arguably the protagonist of Paradise Lost. Um, He basically like starts out the story as like a larger than life, like recently fallen angel. And like throughout the 10 books, like you get all the way back to him being like a serpent who like slinks back into hell. But he is like the most interesting character because like, perfect and infallible characters like god and adam and eve like are very fucking uninspiring but the plot of paradise lost is essentially like satan's trying to reach his goal of like spreading evil and corrupting and adam and eve are working to help humankind find redemption and salvation like but satan's really fun in paradise lost so these are just like some general things about satan but i want to talk about this tie into witchcraft right because this is a witchcraft podcast there's a reason that the idea of Satanism comes up around witchcraft. And it's because the idea of Satanic witchcraft was essentially invented in the 1430s in Central Europe when a group of writers, which included church inquisitors, theologians, lay magistrates, and even a historian, most likely got together to like write these stories about monstrous assemblies of witches gathering to worship demons, eat babies, and have orgies and generally get up to no good. And there's like, look, we don't know for certain that all of these people physically got together and met up, but they all happen to describe these types of groups who were allegedly very active in a, in a zone right around the Western Alps. Like that's very specific. If these people weren't in a room together, they were passing notes in class. Like. <laughs> They were talking. And and they thought we weren't going to notice. But ladies and gentlemen, finally, on a podcast in the year of our Lord 2022, we figured it out. We solved it. We solved it. So why might they have done this dastardly deed? Well, there were church inquisitors and secular courts around this time who wanted to expand their jurisdiction. And having new crimes is awfully handy when you're trying to expand political power and reach. And it was actually like kind of a hard sell for a bit. That's the thing. It's like eventually it like takes root. But initially when they're like trying to like do this pitch, people are like, yeah, I mean, like if a witch is causing a plague or ruining crops, yeah, let's take her to jail. But if she's like having her secret satanic orgies, eh, whatever. So for a while, they're like really pushing this agenda and the public just doesn't give a shit. But then like so many things, right? There's this awful seed and it takes root. And then around 1450, so literally just like a few short years later, like literally like 20 years later, Europe enters like kind of a bad phase, right? Uh, And that's like the perfect, this perfect place for this seed to like, take off so um there's some things like plague in europe in 1450 uh there's wars the church splits into two and then even into three factions there are dueling popes 
at this time in European history. So all of this bad shit's happening. We've planted the seed of satanic witches. And then from stage left enters the printing press. So that's a now, recipe for now we fun. Now we can disseminate these awful ideas to lots of people at once. Yeah. And so Ooh, you that sounds these... that sounds like it's gonna go well. Oh, Facebook told us nothing bad happens when you have new ways for people to disseminate information without proofing. Um, so the other thing is when you're trying to have a spiritual renewal, which if you're church magistrates and you're working in, you know, local courts and you want more power and you really need people to get back into the church, there's nothing quite like a mutual boogeyman to help like get people get those butts in pews, right? And so the satanic witches are the perfect candidate for that. And over time, people eventually like came around to what their leaders were telling them. And so between like the 1400s and the 1700s, we have around 50,000 people, primarily women, executed for witchcraft across Europe. And this is bad. There's no excuse for this. I'm not saying, oh, we got to like take away from what happened. But I do think it's important that we take a step back and kind of examine the super strong anti-Semitic streak that we see in European witch hysteria because it continues to like proliferate throughout history. And this is something that I think is really important as modern witches to own up to because like it's really easy to overlook anti-Semitic tropes that exist in the witchcraft community. So in early modern Europe, there are a lot of like Christian superstitions about Jews uh, and things that Jews were forced to do that might start sounding familiar. So number one, Jews were frequently depicted with physical features associated with the devil, things like horns, clawed feet, talons. There's like this cliche that Jews have like horns under their curly hair, which is like a nod to Moses allegedly having like horns. It's very weird. But around 1215 in Europe, Jews were required to wear a cone-shaped black hat to mark them. And they were so closely associated, like Jewish people were so closely associated with satanic threats that in 1431, Hungary passed a law requiring people accused of sorcery to wear, and I quote, peaked Jews caps. Like the pointed black hat is an anti-Semitic trope. The term synagogue was also very loosely used in medieval writing and particular like into the 12th century by Walter Mapp to refer to any sort of heretical, like heretical meeting place, like anything, anyone, any group of people they consider heretics, their meeting place is called a synagogue. Um, and so we have like the printing press taking off the, this idea of satanic witches but then when you start looking at the pictures of these like witch depictions and you're seeing like these black pointed hats, they've usually got crazy curly big hair. They have large noses. It's like all of these that are really disgusting anti-Semitic tropes that become associated with the witch character. And now think about what Halloween witches look like in modern times. Mm. Hi. Mm. Anti-Semitism. Here to fucking like continue to point out that this is a problem and we just have such a blind spot to it that it's like this idea of like, again, talking about white women fucking usurping everything. It's like, you know, we're not the the daughters of the witches they couldn't burn. Um, we're just not, first of all. But uh, if anyone gets to claim that, it's Jewish we're the, ladies. We're the daughters of the ladies that accused the other ladies of witchcraft. Probably. Um, so Jewish women are probably the daughters and granddaughters of witches they couldn't burn because, um, wow, their people have dealt with a lot. Um, so what a tangled web we weave. And I know it was like we went from Satanism to anti-Semitism, but I just, I really wanted to talk about that because I think that's something that gets glossed over a lot in the like anti, like the witch burning hysteria is like, everyone's like, oh, it was just women. And it's like, I mean, yeah, it was a lot of women, but it was a lot of Jewish women and a lot of like 
tropes associated with Jewish people were used to accuse witches. And so it's like you have to talk about the anti-Semitism that very heavily influenced these problems. Well, and it's what I was talking about with the nine angles too, where it's like there are definitely satanic churches that t- took an anti-Semitic root and became like white power Satanism. But then there's yeah. also kind of the fact that on paper, Satanism empowers women, queers, and uh, people of minority status. But at the same time, all it seems to do is empower like a very small group of white, well-to-do men. Yeah. I mean, look, no one loved the occult like the Nazis. So let's rail against the patriarchy by recreating it faithfully. Yeah, let's not. Um, so my sources today, there's this really great article by Emma Shawkat on um, heyalma.com. There's Jew Witches on Instagram. I do love both of their work is like very, very important if you want to learn about like Jewish mysticism and Jewish magical history and also all the like super anti-Semitic things that have influenced witchcraft throughout the years. Um, of course, JSTOR is amazing. I like went on a bit of a rabbit trail through some JSTOR articles. And then also just like a lot of my early life spent uh, in my grandfather's Southern Baptist church, learning about why I was going to hell. Uh, My grandfather on my dad's side is a, well, was, he's now retired, Southern Baptist pastor. So um, I have a lot of trauma around Satan and sin and the church. Woo! Um. Well, that was incredible, uh, a bit meandering, but it's really hard to cover a topic that big, as I think we both well know, uh, with, without really breaking it down into manageable bits. And um, sometimes we're, <laughs> sometimes it's like, what are we doing? Um, but what I will say is, do you want to do some quick asks before I do the tarot scope? Yeah, y'all. Rate, review, subscribe. Download the episodes. Uh, join our Patreon, patreon.com slash pod. Email us, wandsandfrontspod at gmail.com. Instagram message us, at wandsandfrontspod. Um, Patreon, folks, I, like, posted something asking y'all if you had any topic requests. So, Check your messages. Know. Check Comment. your game messages. Okay. I'm like, come on, y'all. <laughs> okay. So, I could not have gotten a better tarot scope for this very devilish week. So speaking of devilish, this week, the tarot scope is for Scorpio. Ooh. Um, <laughs> you know, our little, our little water devils even. Um, their colors are red and black. I, I, I am gonna highlight that their colors are red and black, very devilish colors. Um, you know, they're jealous, abrasive, and secretive as the negative uh, aspects of Scorpio. Um, but okay, I literally could not have planned this. I literally could not have planned this. And if you're on the Patreon, you're hearing this for the second time. But um, I could not believe in this Satan themed episode <laughs> that I drew the devil reversed for Scorpio. And I'm going to go hey, ahead. Girl, and- hey. I'm trying to not catch the glare from my computer and show you my gorgeous devil card from my dragon tarot at the same time. Um, But okay, so the dragon reversed um, is really saying that the universe is saying it's time for you to level up, which is good. Congratulations on your promotion. Perhaps have a glass of uh, sparkling wine or, um, you know, if you're not feeling that, maybe you could have a glass of sparkling water, but in in a flute. Uh, and unless that would be triggering for you for some reason. Um, I like I like a flute. Sometimes if it's late at night, I'll drink a little glass of milk out of one of my flutes just so they get used. Um, you get to feel fancy. So what I will say is that, yes, the universe is giving you the green light to, to level up uh, spiritually, emotionally, what have you. Um, but really, I also read an interpretation of this card that I personally feel like applies here too, where it's like, if you are going to go through this process of spiritually leveling up in your life, which good for you, um, 
You go, you, Glen Coco. Um, this is also maybe as like a call to action to do that last little bit of spiritual house cleaning so that you do go into this next phase with a clean slate, you know? You're probably most of the way there. Otherwise, you wouldn't be ready to ascend, so to speak. Um, and But, you know, it, it, maybe just clear away those last few cobwebs, um, set things to right. I also, I, I loved the idea Shannon had about using Solomon's seal in the corners of your house to do like, to, to set up like a nice barrier for this next phase and kind of seal the goodness of, of the spiritual leveling up in um, and keep the, the, the badness that you've worked so hard to expel from your life where it belongs. Um, so definitely be mindful of like transitional phases are definitely a place where you can get rid of things. Yeah. You know, it's almost like, it's like the spiritual version of moving, you know, it's like something you should always do when you're moving is get rid of things that no longer serve you. Because otherwise you're just going to be what bringing them to the new place, ex using all of that in time and energy. You don't want to do that. Just get rid of it. Nope. Do some spring cleaning, y'all. Do some spring cleaning. Do some spring cleaning, my lovely Scorpios, because it's time and it's your time. Um, and, you know, maybe you see this as a call to action to just do a little spiritual house cleaning. That's all I'm saying. Like, good for you for leveling up. But it's always a good time when you are, again, in a transitional phase to get rid of things that are no longer serving you. So that's all I have for you guys. I think overall a pretty positive message though. I do. I like it. I feel like in Scorpio, you're so good at transformation. So and it's, it's like, like, you got this. And it's like the end of your season and we're finally past the eclipse, you know, that kind of like an eclipse, man. That eclipse really just sucked the ghost out of me. I feel like the shadow period, like after this eclipse is like a weight around my neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's the albatross. Yeah. Wait. My neck is tired. I got a crick. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> um, but what do we say to all the satanic bitches out there worshiping the devil? To all you satanic <laughs> bitches, blessed be bitches. Blessed be you devilish bitches. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye now.